Now you had um, a grant from the Soros Foundation, yeah. that's mm -hmm. right, yep. to work on some project. Software package, yeah. How's that going? Very well. Uh, the very first version that I would actually let out in the public is now available on my website. What's it called? Minsky. Minsky. Okay. So the idea of that is now, that is this similar to QED? Or yeah, other software? yeah, yeah. It's not as um, not as it doesn't look as swish as QED yet. Um, that but what it does that QED doesn't do is you can actually you, the whole idea is to model monetary dynamics. So you know this is again you and I are used to this, but economists pretend that the economy has no banks and no money in it. You know. And I think that's sensible. I mean, Paul Krugman has been enormous. It's, it's sensible that they do that. Or oh, I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you, Paul Krugman, when he, when he had that debate, did you see the fight he had with me in the New York Times? No. Okay, well, go on to Paul Krugman's blog and search for Steve Kane. Okay. Did he like? Did you have like in the same issue? Did you? No, no. Well, he has a blog, okay. and he, you know, he also writes in the commentary for them, of course. And he and I were both scheduled to go and talk at the INET conference. He. he INET. Inst that there's the George Soros' group, the Institute for New Economic Thinking okay, in right. Berlin. Uh, apparently his wife went along, but he didn't in the end. He'd, found, he'd, he'd personal commitments. His wife went, but he didn't? Yeah, I mean, maybe there's, God knows, maybe he was taking care of the kids that week. I don't know, but okay. he didn't turn up. And he said he wasn't going to turn up at the blog, but he therefore, I posted my paper that I was giving on my blog. It was then copied onto credit write-downs, and he then read well, credit right down as a website. Yeah, you know, a very good website. <coughs> Pardon me. He he's skimmed my paper, and I started saying how uh, there are a whole bunch of neoclassicals turning up who are now calling themselves Minskyan. And I said, when I read, as which some, they are. Pardon? Which they are. Oh, yeah, they're 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 I mean, they call themselves Keynesian as well. Which, and they I, are. which they are. And I said, when in debunking economic at one stage, I said, if they can call themselves Keynesian, then I can call myself a duck because I can say the word quack. You know, the, the, their knowledge of Keynes and their knowledge of Minsky is incredibly deficient. And I think you've told me before that you don't think they've even read Keynes's original work. Oh, they would read or it. They it. haven't understood it. Yeah, well, see, what, about well it. see, Keynes's original work is a bit like a, um, it's a bit like the Bible. You know, in it, you want to find Hodge, something, Hodgepodge, you yeah. find any, you know, read, read far enough, you can find something to support virtually anything, you know? Okay. okay. Um, so that's partly, if you, if, you, if you come with your own framework to is the... That, is that, in your opinion, opinion like a strong point? No, God, no. no. No, no, anything but. No, Keynes... So you're saying I, his writing wasn't so great? I think, <laughs> yeah. Well, he, what, what, do you, what I actually often describe Keynes as being like is like a snake that was shedding its skin and in 1936, the skin was half off. Okay. Okay. So if you went looking at what he wrote in 1936, you could find the old skin and think, hey, this is familiar. I can work with this. So he was learning he was, and he was writing as he it, was it's, a, it's probably a better way to say more like a, going from a, from a um, what's the idea, from a, a you know, slug to a butterfly. A, you know, it, or it, a novice understanding to a more expert. Or to a, to a new transformed vision. So his... He, uh, he so actually, his final works would be the ones to really Which at. means 1937. Okay. The papers in 1937 are much, much clearer. So if you wanted to actually understand Keynes, don't read the general theory of employment, really? in, interest, and money. No, read I the, tried to read that. And yeah, what did I you should skip. Yeah. Well, I didn't read a whole lot. <laughs> well, read a little paper in 1937 called The General Theory of Employment. Okay. That'll, that's about 13 pages. So that's, that, that is the... The, you know, like that, that's the butterfly, whereas beforehand you had, you know, I, I can't think of the word, the slug, that'll do. Pupa. Pu pupa, okay. <laughs> uh, so the general theory is pupa plus a bit of, <laughs> caterpillar plus a bit of butterfly. Okay. And the, by 37 you're getting more of the butterfly. Then in 38 he has a serious heart attack uh, and gets in, caught up in the brilliance of the war effort when he recovers from that. Caught up in, you know, try, in, in, in trying to maintain the budget during the Second World War. Dies in 44. Was it 44 or 46? 1946, I think. So, so did he's he do anything? He did a lot. After 37, then? He did a lot after 37, but much, much more focused on the war effort and so on. Okay. Uh, I'm not an expert on Keynes' writings in general. I mean, I can I pull them, you know, the, the, the people I could, a mate of mine, Rod O'Donnell, would be, uh, knows Keynes' writing when he was, I think, eight through to, you know, death. Uh, you've got Mogridge, you have uh, Skidelsky and so on, who specialised in everything he's written. The complete volume... Now, are these also 
post-Keynesians like yourself, these folks you just mentioned? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Skidelsky is not quite more of a, a historian of economic thought than actually devoted to one school or another, but Rod's a post-Keynesian and so on. So there are people who know all of Keynes' writing better than I do. Uh, but my, my uh, preference would be to say those papers in 37, there's another one called the Alternative Theories of the Rate of Interest, and there's a third, I can't quite think of their name right now. Um, but they are the butterfly. Okay? Well, if you read the, just the general theory, you can find what look like neoclassical concepts in there and think, oh, take those neoclassical concepts out and use that as Keynes. So why did he write these papers in 37 after he'd written the book? Because of reactions to the book. Because people didn't understand it? Well, people didn't understand it, or they clearly missed... didn't think that he was writing clearly enough? And he was also... He, he was changing... Process. His, his processes were developing. There's chapter 12 of the general theory is the one that people like myself build on. And chapter 12 is the one where he gives the analogy about... What's that about? That, that, that's talking about the state of long-run expectations. And he says, how do people form expectations about the future? He said, Just individuals? Uh, in, well, individual, then collectively or society as well. Society. So, so he said, um, we have to make, if you're going to make an investment decision, you have to decide to do something based on what's going to happen in the future, which right. you can't possibly know. Right. So he said, how do we, but you also can't well, decide. that's what everybody's doing right now, right? With yeah. the stock markets yeah. and the 401ks, yeah. they're saying, they're imagining that in the future this is going to continue going up for a long, long time. Yeah. I mean, if they're Which, younger, then they're going to be retiring and the stock market's going to go up. Yeah, that's, that's, their, that's their prayer. So okay. you have to have, I but mean, see, if you're investing, you're really gambling, and yeah. you have to have some sort of expectation. Yeah. Well, Cain okay, said, how do you form those expectations? Because the most important information is information you can't possibly have information about the future. Now I've used that phrase for a very good reason because at a short, when I get a chance on my blog I'm going to be showing a conversation I had with a leading neoclassical economist where he used precisely those terms. What if people get more information about the future? How will that change things? What if what? Yeah, you heard me. What if people, if get, people get more information about the future? How would that change things? How would they get information about the future? A simple Michael Fox just hops in the car and comes <laughs> back. It, you look Back at this. To the future. Oh, you know, the delusional. I no, prefer the time traveler's wife, actually, where he goes and gets the lotto numbers and comes back and has memorized the numbers and wins the lottery. <laughs> well, that's also part of the subtext of Back <laughs> to the Future, but anyway. Um, so I, I, I um, you know, it, it's bizarre that neoclassical economists have done that because back when Keynes wrote, uh, he, one of the beautiful phrases used was to say that IQ's classical economic theory, by which we meant what we call neoclassical today, IQ's the classical economic theory of being one of those pretty polite techniques designed for a well-paneled boardroom, which tries to deal, deal with, the, with, the, with the present b by abstracting from the fact that we know very little, we know nothing about the future. So that was his way of saying this. Keynes. Okay. Okay. Now so what you've got. So say that again in layman's terms. Okay. Well, well what he's saying is. We have to make decisions about the future. Yeah. They affect the present. Of course. Okay. You're making a decision now. And near, near on your actions. Yeah. Near, the neoclassical theory of his day ignored the fact that you were making decisions about what might happen in the future to do something today. How else would you be making decisions? Well. How about what to do? Well, the thing is, neoclassical economists after Keynes have regrouped, and okay. what they now do is assume we can all. We all know the future, because what they call rational, and this is the bizarre thing, their definition of rational is your definition of prophetic. Okay? Uh, and and there's, a, there's a paper which played a major role in leading to the development of what they call rational expectations, macroeconomics. Now you heard the word rational, you know, it sounds like oh, we're talking about sensible people, aren't we? I mean, well, you don't, I would want to have irrational expectations. Sure. So they've stolen the word. But the way they define rational means everybody can accurately predict the future rate of inflation. That's the definition of rational. Everybody, moms and pops. And the whole lot of we all know. and children. And we all have a middle model in our mind, which happens to be the neoclassical model of the world, that tells us that if the government increases the money supply by 10%, Prices will therefore rise by 10% the next year. So we put our prices up now, completely neutralizing what the government was trying to do, which was to get an impact on the quantity of output. Instead, it all goes into price. Now that, that sounds like magical thinking to me. 
Yeah, it really is, you know, woo 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 stuff. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's what they call neoclassical economics today. So, so Steve, are you saying neoclassical economists are woo woo? Don't yes, know what I am. talking about people? They, they, the Should level of. Should regular people, moms and pops and retirees be listening to these people? No, not at all. <laughs> they're, they're delusional. Even a little bit? No. Um, I mean, Would it be better for them to listen to astrologers and hocus pocus people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, reasonable odds. I mean, uh, I mean, for example, if if <laughs> this is the thing which is so um, so stunning, if they missed the financial crisis coming, which is the biggest. Well, how much did they miss it now? C completely. Okay, so we're talking about two thousand and seven, right? Two thousand and seven. So what happened? Like uh, what? the the Dow Jones went from fourteen thousand. Fourteen thousand to seven thousand within yeah. several months. Yeah. Six yeah. months. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, then the economy went from being a booming state, you know, unemployment below okay, below five yeah, percent up to a nine and ten. That was in, primarily in the U.S. Well, it's worse in Europe, but yeah, it's, I mean, in England is worse as well. So England had a worse crisis than America now, even though it didn't go down as sharply at the beginning. But weren't people talking about like the housing bubble and people getting maxed out on credit and? Yeah, but for example, I mean, people, there were certain people, Robert Schiller, I think of all the people who come from a neoclassical he's background. He's house, housing. Yeah, now he's, he's the one who has, he the, the he's, he's got absolutely every right to say he saw this coming. Okay. Okay, Robert Schiller. Because he looks at the data. And he's looked like, at the data, he actually, he, the phrase of rational exuberance that Greenspan used and then abused was, was Robert Schiller's phrase. So should uh, people listen to Alan Greenspan when he tells them advice? Only if they can't find the comedy channel. You know? So you, I don't, mean, you, you don't hold him in high regard? No, not at all. Never did. Never did. I mean, um, but he was like our top, top economist in the US yeah, but for he, decades. Yeah, I know. And that's one reason why he got so stuffed up. I mean, I, I can understand to some extent Greenspan's motivation because if you're governor of the central bank and there's a financial crisis within months of you taking over the job, which was 1987, he then went out there and, and, and just guaranteed everybody liquidity. As you said, any any firm that was potentially going to fold, you're we, saying money. Right? Yeah, well, the, yeah, and what it means is if you Essentially if you money. If, well, so if you, your you, bank's running out of money, we'll lend you more money. That's right. We'll no lend problem. you the, if you if, even if you don't care what your financial not quite don't quite care, but you know if, if you're financially in a situation where if you have a payment to make that you can't make out of your own resources, we'll lend you the money so you can make the payment. Okay. Now that meant that we had a, you know a twenty percent fall in Dow Jones in one day back in October nineteen eighty seven those, enough young people wouldn't know that now, 20% in one day. 20%? Yeah, yeah. Okay. When so that's like way more than normal risk distribution. Well, normal distribution like is 1%. Okay. okay, so this is like 20, 20, 1 in 20,000 years or something. No, 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 no. If you actually work it out, it's 1 in 20,000 lives of the universe. Okay. Okay. So this is On the normal minutes. distribution, okay. if it applied the normal distribution, you literally would have to wait something of the order of Ten, uh, you know, ten thousand, 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 million, 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 billion, billion years to get that event. If it was a normal distribution. Well, which it's not. So we know it's not. We know it's not. That, that, we, but he still comes from the mindset that that's the case. So, you know, unpredictable event, uh, scale beyond belief, uh, have to stop the system crashing, put the liquidity out there. We have a downturn, but very, very mild, and on we go to the next bubble, which happened to be the uh, savings and loans bubble. Okay, so he rescued from that one, and this whole practice of rescue, rescue, rescue Wait, got built in. What he, what he did, did it actually have a positive impact or not? It had a positive impact in that it stopped a lot of organisations that should have gone bankrupt from going bankrupt. Is that positive? Or no, it's partially so positive. He he, well, what, not lot, but yeah. you ha, what, you, would, what would you have done? Well, I would have, I would have actually wiped out the capital of the organizations that... Um, Give me like an example. I would say Goldman Sachs, for example, okay, found so itself, Goldman Sachs. then it would, be, it would go into receivership. You continue operating... It would be, be owned by the government temporarily. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then sold back into the private sector later. But so you, like uh, General Motors, that happened to General Motors, right? Well, yeah, but it didn't get quite sold back into... Did, 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 take, did the public take over at all? It was in, think, wasn't receivership, as far as I'm aware. I could be wrong. I don't remember. Yeah, but anyway, that's that sort of. When you have somebody taking an enormous bet like that, then you need to have some consequences of that bet going bad that aren't positive. Now, what actually happened was, of course, you. Now, would that have been, um, if if these banks had went into receivership back then, mm. would that have? 
impacted the employment rate differently than what actually did happen? Yeah, you could have had you would have had a potentially a mini depression back then. Okay. If so you look did at he it, prevent a mini, mini he depression? prevented a mini depression, which is why we're having a really good one now. The, what was actually going on behind all this, and this is the stuff that Greenspan and conventional economics completely ignore, is a rising level of private debt. Okay. 